Um, but today we have a very exciting speaker here, Alfonso de Villa. Um, Alfonso, and he's here from Ames. Um, he's been with Ames about 10 years and has just recently become a civil servant. And before that was a contractor with SETI working at Ames. So um, he is currently in the exobiology branch of NASA Ames. Uh, looking at terrestrial analog environments to assess the potential hab habitability of other planetary bodies and developing strategies for life detection based on first principles in biology and biochemistry. Currently, he conducts field investigations in the most extreme deserts on Earth, provides scientific advice for the maturation of instruments of space exploration, and helps develop mission concepts to surf for, search for as evidence of life on Mars, Europa, and Encel... Enceladus. Enceladus. Yes. Thank you. By the end of it all, you'll know the name very yes. well. Yes, <laughs> I'll know it really well. So um, please help me welcome Alfonso. Great. Thank you. Thanks for coming, and thanks everybody who's listening on the radio waves. Um, the, um, I'm, it's, I'm happy to be here and share some of the latest thinking that our group has been developing at NASA Ames in terms of the search for life, specifically the search for a second genesis of life. So. Uh, to begin with, I'll tell you what the motivation is for me to be here, here meaning Ames, studying this, this specific topic and the way we do it that way. When I first landed at Ames 10 years ago, uh, my mentor back then gave me the most important advice that I've received in my career, and he said, the most important question in science you always have to keep asking yourself is why. Every time you make a decision, you decide to do something, ask yourself why. And that applies to the questions you're asking, how you're addressing them, why you're addressing them that way, why that experiment, why that observation. So it's constant why, why, why that takes us today to the kind of topic that we're talking, discussing, and it's as you will see, there's still a lot of that needs to be done, but why is the motivating uh, question behind all this? Now itself, this, this question itself, it leads to uh, self-doubt and long-term psychological damage, but that's secondary. As long as your science is good, he said, uh, your papers are gonna be solid, just keep asking why. And so, uh, really, in asking why are we searching for a sec, why are we searching for life in the first place? Why should we water? Uh, and then uh, starting to go down the, uh, the uh, chain of, of reasoning, the chain of logic, uh, a lot of these that you're going to see today, that's, that's what came out of this, this kind of asking why. Now, <clears throat> this is probably the best reason why we should bother about, we should care about searching for a second genesis of life. And some of you might sympathize with the concept. It's the zero one infinity rule is the idea that things, there are three shapes, three forms that things can exist in the universe. Uh, either they don't exist, or they're unique, or there is many of them. Really two, there's no such thing as two things in the universe. And so right now we are uh, past the zero, there's life on Earth, so we know there is at least one example in our, equation, in, a, in our equation of life in the universe. The question is whether it's the unique one, or there is infinite forms of life. And it only takes one other, in my opinion, form of life out there that shares, does not share an origin with life on Earth to conclude that there is infinite forms of life in the universe. That's only based on the sheer number of exoplanets there are, we know there are out there and how many of those we know have likely the, the, the right conditions to support life. Now, <clears throat> I'm not gonna focus on exoplanets today because it turns out that our own solar system already has plenty of places where life could actually potentially exist today. Places that in fact, uh, microorganisms, some microorganisms on Earth will be able to not only survive those environments, but actually thrive in them. And, uh, and we're going to run through some of those examples today. So the motivation is very simple. Find another example of life so that we can convince ourselves that life is an, actually, it's an actual cosmic phenomenon. It's not something that happened once accidentally on our planet. And so what we're looking for, as I just said, right now there is an example of one. There is no escaping that. that motivates the search, it also limits the way we search because our knowledge is, is based on this one example of life in the universe. And it, as scientists, we've been struggling for many years on going from a data number of one to, a, the, all the range, to cover all the possible range, all, all, the possible, all the possibilities for life outside of the planet. Obviously, you're continuously being limited and constrained by your understanding of what you know, and in this case, what we know is only one life on Earth. Despite all its diversity, when you look at it fundamentally at the chemical level, life on Earth is very non-diverse. It's, uh, it's all very similar. We'll talk about this in a second. Now, what we, what we really mean by a second genesis of life 
is exactly this, a, sec a form of life not related to life on Earth. Now, this is a simple statement, but uh, it's not clear to a lot of people, and including a lot of researchers, what the meaning of a second genesis really means, uh, really is. Uh, something that is not related to us. It's not something that easy to, uh, it's not a question that easy to address. Okay, what's next? So I'm gonna go through a number of places. I just told you in a second, there is lots of examples. Now we know of many exoplanets that are at the right distance from their parent stars that liquid water could be stable on the surface. That's great for exobiology. But we're actually interested, or I am actually interested in the possibility of life in the solar system. Not for anything, but, the, but because of the fact that any form of life not in the solar system, it's almost irrelevant to us. We will never be able to look at it. We will never be able to interact with it in a direct manner, just because of the enormous distance between the, uh, all different stars. Only a form of life in our solar system uh, outside of the Earth could help us really understand the basic principles of life, could help us develop a theory of life, because that's a form of life we could dissect, we could break apart, we could analyze in detail the same way we, are, we analyze life on Earth. Life on an exoplanet, awesome, but other than we know it's there, it wouldn't really help us advance scientifically much uh, about the understanding of life uh, and, and, the, and the way life originates and all these interesting questions that motivates the search. Now, it turns out that there, there, is a certain, there is a fair number of places in the solar system that we could potentially think about searching for evidence of life. The first one that comes to mind is present-day Mars. Um, we know for a fact that Mars is a non, it's not a habitable planet today. Anything we know any form of life we know of would die on the surface of Mars almost immediately due to exposure of either toxic chemistry in the soil or UV radiation. Uh, not, not to speak about the cold temperatures and all that nasty stuff. But we know that <clears throat> conditions on the surface of Mars do change with time, just like conditions on the Earth. There are ice ages on Mars, same way that there are ice ages on Earth, triggered by changes in the or uh, orbital parameters of the planet. And we know that not only five to 10 million years ago, conditions on the surface of Mars were actually warm enough to melt some of these occurrences of ground ice very close to the surface. This is an impact crater on the surface of Mars that happened very recently. It was actually captured in 2008. There is a number of documented cases like this. It was small, but it was big enough to excavate some of this white stuff, and this white stuff turns out to be water ice very close to the surface. And some of these craters uh, are found here in the mid latitudes of Mars, actually, BL2 here is the Viking 2 landing site. Viking might have missed ground ice only by about 10 centimeters uh, back in 1975. Research, Mars exploration would have been a lot different if Viking had excavated a tiny bit deeper into the soil. But the bottom line is that uh, at these low latitudes, there is examples of ground ice very close to the surface, less than one meter. These ground ice can get warm enough uh, during high obliquity periods for, these, uh, for this to melt and generate conditions that at least could be transiently habitable. So it's a very interesting place to search for possible evidence of life. Now, I like to think of Mars as actually a tale of two planets. Um, <clears throat> early Mars was a very different planet. And I, I think of it as different, um, in fact, as a different planet. And the way we, we might want to search for life in that planet is different the way we would search for life on Mars today. We know now, based on data from the Curiosity rover, that there were lakes on Mars about three and a half billion years ago, that those lakes would have been habitable to life forms, to, to life, to life forms that exist today on the Earth. Even to us, we could drink that water. The pH was okay, the saltiness was okay, the composition was fine. There was nothing in that water that would prevent li life from growing in it. it had all the, re all the requirements, nutrients, and energy sources to grow and reproduce. That existed on the planet three and a half billion years ago. There is evidence that there were many such examples of habitable environments on the surface. In fact, people have proposed the existence of a large northern ocean uh, in the uh, northern hemisphere of Mars, occupying a big portion of the planet's surface. Uh, and now we have rovers. The MSL Curiosity rover is studying these sediments, which was deposited in that lake environment, searching for possible chemical signatures of habitability. And eventually, if, uh, if they get lucky, maybe chemical signatures of life. Uh, a, big, a very important first step was the discovery of organic matter preserved in those sediments. Organics, as we will see, is probably the first requirement you need as a scientist to decide to go searching for life on a place, just because the basic fact that life is made of organic matter. And so we do have the Mars Science Laboratory mission currently studying these 
environments. The ExoMars, the European lander, is going to go to Mars in 2020. Around 2020, kept getting delayed, but hopefully 2020 is the last one. Uh, it's equipped to search for evidence of life using several instruments. Mars 2020 is another NASA mission that is being prepared for uh, to return to Mars, and it would be the first step towards a sample return mission. That would be the first mission that would cache a sample or a number of samples and would wait for a future mission to bring those samples back to Earth for study. So one possible place to, for Mars 2020 to land would be one of those ancient lake deposits. So lots of exciting things coming up. Now, <clears throat> a lot of, most of the public is familiar with this stuff. This is not new. But what's been developing in the last few years is the concept of ocean worlds. Europa, you probably know about that one. That's the moon of Jupiter. We know for a fact, or as much of a fact you can get without seeing it directly, that uh, Europa has an ocean under an ice cover of about 90 kilometers, 50 or 60 miles. Uh, that ocean, it's, it's been postulated pretty much since the Galileo missions from almost 30 or 40 years ago. But now there is plenty of good evidence based on morphology on the surface that there is, in fact, an ocean of liquid water under the ice shell. And that ocean is probably about uh, 100 kilometers deep. There's plenty of uh, water down there. Recently, there was even indications of a plume of uh, water vapor ejecting from the surface of the planet that could be linked to the subsurface ocean, although that hasn't been demonstrated or validated yet. It's just one observation. Now, this obviously makes it a very interesting place for life. Ocean, liquid water, uh, deep, far away from nasty radiation. Uh, that could be an interesting place to go. Unfortunately, technologically, it's really hard to get there. Now, <clears throat> the astrobiology community, the planetary science community in general, has been always interested in landing on the surface of Europa. Uh, for many years, we thought it would take uh, an act of God to actually do that. Technologically, it's very complicated. Turns out it would be, it, 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 it actually, it's, it, it was worth, uh, worse than that. It actually took an act of Congress for us to go to the surface of Europa. But last year, Congress actually provided some text <clears throat> demanding or asking NASA to actually put together a mission to land on the surface of Europa in the next decade. And not only to land, but also to search for life. That got everybody very, very excited. And there is currently, uh, there's going to be a call for instruments at the end of this year, early next year, for the community to propose instruments that would go on that lander and that would probably land on Europa, hopefully, uh, within the next 10 years. And they would go to a place on the surface, probably one of these chaos regions, which morphologically they look like. It's actually upwelling of groundwater from the ocean going all the way through the ice cover and then freezing on the surface. So it would be a mission that without accessing directly the ocean would still, might still be able to analyze ocean materials. It's a very exciting mission. Now, <clears throat> there is another exciting place in the solar system. That's Titan. That's the moon of Saturn. Titan is very interesting because it's very alien. It's probably the most alien place in the solar system in the sense that it's very different from everything else. It's a moon of a fairly large size. It's the largest moon of Saturn. Uh, but the interesting thing about Titan are these spots on the surface, mostly in the northern hemisphere of the moon, which are lakes. But they're not lakes of water. They're lakes of hydrocarbon. They're mostly made of me liquid methane, liquid ethane. And that's what makes the moon interesting and alien at the same time. It's because no there is nothing really that is about this that is familiar to us. Liquid me uh, methane happens at minus 150 degrees. Uh, so, uh, centigrade, so it's an environment that we don't really understand. But there has been models proposed by scientists on how life could actually exist in these lakes. It would be life unlike anything we know of. Obviously, we can't not even imagine the biochemistry of those forms of life. It wouldn't be water-based. It could be carbon-based, but it would be a chemistry completely different from what we're used to. So it's actually really hard to come up with ways of searching for evidence of life uh, on Titan, because you don't really know where to begin. But there has been several missions proposed to uh, go to Titan within the next 15, 20 years. Uh, and some of them are actually being considered as we speak uh, by a review panel at NASA uh, for flight in the next, uh, in, an, in an upcoming run of missions. So Titan is very interesting, very alien. But my favorite place is actually Enceladus. Uh, Enceladus is a tiny moon. Maybe you know of it because it was in the news recently. It's been in the news for a while, but recently it made a big splash. I'll tell you in a second why. But Enceladus is a tiny moon. It's about the diameter between here and LA. It's not a big moon. Um, but it, it's unique in the sense that it has these active geysers coming out of the surface. This is an actual picture of Enceladus taken by the Cassini mission. And in the south pole of the moon, you can see here a picture centered at the south pole. 
there is these features here, features on the surface. These are called tiger stripes. These are cracks in the ice shelf, in the ice shell of the moon. And through these cracks, there is stuff venting into space. That was discovered by Cassini, an orbiter in the Saturn system that NASA and the Europeans sent together in the 1923, uh, 2003. Uh, took this, has been investigating this moon for the last 10, in 20, uh, 15 years. Now the, the Cassini is just plunging into Saturn as we speak. It's the end of the mission. But through the lifetime of the mission, we've been able to, NASA has been able to fly that spacecraft through the plumes of Enceladus multiple times and study the chemistry of those plumes. It turns out that those plumes are made mostly of water. They contain CO2, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. This is great for microbes. This is candy for some microbes. It's an energy so source for uh, microorganisms on Earth. On top of that, we know that those geysers contain salts, sodium, just very similar to the salts that make up the ocean of the Earth. And they also contain, contain tiny silica grains, a few nanometers. Silica is the stuff that is made in hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. <clears throat> and organics. It seems to be lots of organics up to, at least Cassini detected, up to, up to carbon-6 organics. Carbon-6 uh, is was the limit of detection of the instrument. They couldn't see things bigger than carbon-6 for a number of reasons. So the expectation is that there are probably more complex organics in the ocean. And all those samples are coming into space for free. And so they're just waiting for us to send a spacecraft and continue looking at that chemistry for free. Maybe not for free, maybe $850 billion. But once you get there, the samples are for free. So um, <clears throat> recently, uh, uh, our team at NASA Ames, in collaboration with Goddard Space Flight Center and the uh, uh, APL laboratories at Johns Hopkins University, we proposed a mission to do precisely that, to return to Enceladus and search for evidence of life in the uh, plume materials coming out of the South Pole. Now, if that mission gets selected by NASA, it's going to make it there somewhere it, sometime in the mid-2030s. Um, I, ex I expect to be there, quit smoking, started running. So, um, <laughs> Uh, but it's one of those things that it shows you how complicated technologically these missions can be because of the distance, because of the uh, complexity of the science and all these type of things. But in the meantime, we have 25 years to figure things out. That's the good news. And so we keep studying the, uh, all the data that comes back from Cassini. And that I uh, just wanted to share with you some latest results of a conceptual model we built, very simple model, but I think it's very important based on Cassini data. So I told you that Cassini detected hydrogen uh, coming out of the... Uh, of the plume, and it also uh, detected silica grains. The silica has already been linked to hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the Enceladus ocean. So this would be a cross-section of the moon with the ice shelf and the plumes in the southern hemisphere. We know that there is an ocean based on the composition of the plumes. We know that there is hydrothermal activity at the ocean sediment interface based on the presence of those silica nanoparticles. Uh, now, when we take the composition, that composition that comes out of Cassini, and we put it in the ocean, and we shake it, and we run our geochemical models, it turns out that all that gas, hydrogen and methane that is being detected in the plume, has to be forming here at the bottom of the ocean. And as quickly, as soon as it forms, it actually starts bubbling, because there is so much gas that it's actually above the hydrostatic pressure, and then that gas forms bubbles. And those bubbles, what do bubbles do? They rise. They like to go up, and we've been running some models to estimate how big those bubbles would, how fast they would rise, how big they would be. Turns out it might be enough uh, gas in there to mix the entire ocean, which is good for us. But most importantly, it's enough stuff to bring hydrothermal vent fluids. This is an example of a picture from the ocean on the Earth, where you can see the hydrothermal vents uh, pumping fluids into the ocean. These fluids could go straight up into the plumes in about uh, timescales of uh, several months, Earth months, just aided by these uh, rapid rays of bubbles, which means that what we're sampling in the moon actually has a significant amount of hydrothermal material living in there. Why is that important? Because we know that there are microbes on the Earth that like to grow around these hydrothermal vents. Also shrimp and other stuff. We don't expect shrimp on Enceladus, but, but the, microbes are, the microbes will be enough and they will be fine. If we have an ecosystem of microbes developing at the bottom of these hydrothermal vents, using that hydrogen and methane and CO2 and nutrients to grow and reproduce, some of those microbes, or at least their decay products, they could get entrained in this rising plume, come back uh, shooting through the, through the geysers. 
I mean through the plumes on the surface. Our spacecraft could catch those microbes or the chemistry associated to them and maybe find evidence for life. So this, is the, this gets my five stars as the most interesting destination in the solar system. Uh, even vacation would be interesting there. So um, <clears throat> now the question that <coughs> brings us at this point is there is obviously the search for life, the search for second genesis. I hope that I convince you that it's timely. We now have plenty of destinations to go to. Um, and it's real. It's a, it's a reality. I'm not saying there is life there. I'm just saying that all the conditions we could hope for are met there. So there is no really uh, excuse not to continue investigating. Now the question, next question is how do we discover a second genesis of life? That's what's going to take us mostly of the rest of the, of the talk. Now, <laughs> up until recently, <clears throat> this is pretty much what our understanding of uh, extraterrestrial forms of life. Uh, aliens are typically defined geographically. If something is not uh, part of the planet, it must be an alien, must be a second genesis of life. But that really, that's not, uh, that's nothing that's, that's not a statement that is scientifically, uh, you, you can't support it with scientific data just yet. Uh, <clears throat> there's been plenty of models uh, tossed around about panspermia. Probably you're familiar with the concept. Panspermia is the transfer of life between planetary bodies. There are actually different flavors of panspermia. There's been uh, the most unlikely type of panspermia you can think of. It's interstellar panspermia, the transfer of life between distant solar systems. Now, these models, the only reason they're considered is, is the, uh, because the probabilities are so low. The only, things that make, the only thing that makes these models palatable to a scientist is the enormous time that the universe has been around. And so when you factor in time, then anything is possible. Uh, but we're not, <coughs> uh, panspermia fans are not really uh, clinching their hopes on these interstellar panspermia. They're mostly thinking on two different types of more local panspermia. Cometary panspermia, planetary panspermia. First one, cometary, is the idea that uh, our solar system didn't come out of nowhere. Uh, our sun formed from the um, um, <coughs> accumulation of gas that resulted from the explosion of a previous sun. As far as we know now, probably that sun also had planets based on what we know about suns in the universe. People have proposed that if life evolved on that previous solar system or any of the previous solar systems that existed before our own, in the same spot in the universe, then those forms of life could have been uh, hanging around while the planets were forming and then come back to colonize uh, the right planets back again. That's cometary panspermia. Uh, some people have postulated that the universe is actually percolating through with, it's percolated with uh, uh, materials that contain, could contain uh, forms of life preserved in them and that could be seeding the universe throughout. Now you might, the interesting thing about panspermia is you might believe it or not, it doesn't matter. Belief is not a scientific uh, valid approach. There is nothing that, that suggests that this theory is wrong. And that goes, at the, that goes to the core of the problem of how we search for a second genesis of life and why we need to search for a second genesis of life. The last one is the one you know probably you're more familiar with, it's planetary panspermia. It's the concept that planets, after they formed in the solar system, they've been literally exchanging spit uh, back and forth. Early on, they were younger, they were more, uh, okay, I'm not gonna go there, but there was a lot of exchange <laughs> going on early on in the history of the solar system. There's plenty of meteorites from Mars on Earth. There is meteorites from Earth on Mars. People have actually estimated the probability, given a number of factors of life transferring between planets, starting on Earth, ground zero, even that 13% chances that biological material could be actually successfully transferred to Venus not a small chance of life transferred to Mars, back and forth. Actually, people have postulated an origin of life on Mars and later transferred to Earth, based on a number of geochemical prisons. Even places like Europa and Enceladus, there is a very small, but still uh, existing probability that life could be transferred between them. So the bottom line of this is that you cannot assume that aliens can be geographically de de defined. Geographics don't apply to aliens at least unless we know unless we find a second example of life that, can, that we can use to prove it. So these, uh, this needs to revision. We need to update our concept, how we treat aliens in many different ways. Um, and so <clears throat> the question then comes, so how do we search for a second genesis? If we can't just go find life somewhere else and claim second genesis, then how do we search for it? 
And I'm going to go through a, through a short thought process that I'm hopefully exemplifies the way we've been doing this, we've been going about this business for the num a number of decades now, searching for life. But I'm going to use a different example. So take this picture of the universe. And we know now that there are more planets than stars in the galaxy. And there is plenty of galaxies out there, so there is a large number of planets out there. Now, think for a second that Earth is the only planet we know. There's no other planet in the solar system. Earth is now our number one. Everything we know about planets is captured in the Earth. And, uh, but we decided to search for other planets out there. Are there other planets other than the Earth? We could devise an experiment uh, where we take our planet, we look at the way it's made, the way it's built, the composition, the shape, the size, and everything, and we can define a series of what we would call planet signatures. And then we could, go, we, could be, we could build a telescope and start searching for planets out there based on the presence or absence of those planet signatures. We could try to search for direct imaging, morphology. If we see something that moves, stars that move, if something moves, a wanderer, there should be a planet, we could, we could look for that, we could look for motion, we could look for unique compositions. We know that the atmosphere of the Earth is very unique. It's very unlikely to exist somewhere else, uh, especially uh, in places like stars or round stars. And so if we see an anomaly of nitrogen and oxygen, for example, we could claim that there is a planet out there. Now, you can guess that this is not a very efficient way of looking at planets. And in fact, that's not how we look at planets. The way we look at planets around other stars is by a number of methods, but mostly they're focused on looking at a star and looking for anomalies in what we know about that star. In this case, the anomaly is represented as a, law, as a, decrease, as a decline in brightness. So here we have uh, a spectra of the brightness of this star. In this case, this is actually, I think this is Venus going around our own sun. The same applies to other planets. And we see how when the planet uh, crosses in front of the star, the brightness of the star decreases in a predictable way. Now, obviously, this is not what we see when we look at exoplanets. This is what we see when we look at exoplanets. We don't actually see the planet. Bottom line is, we don't need to look for planets in order to search for planets. We don't need to look for planet signatures. What we need to do is we need to focus on something that we understand very well, whose physical laws are very well understood, and see if there is any, anything in those in the behavior of that object that, does, can, that cannot be explained by what we know about physics. This is, in fact, the way we search for planets. Maybe not consciously, but it's a very robust way of looking for planets because you're not presupposing anything about those planets. If all, if all we knew was that planets are made of oxygen, have an atmosphere of oxygen and nitrogen, and, not, and they are the size of the Earth, and they look blue, and that's all we look for, we'd still be looking for planets today, and we, we wouldn't have found anyone. Uh, we need to be able to search for planets without looking for planets. Discovering planets without searching for planets. Now, <clears throat> that's not how we've been searching for life. Despite, we also start with a data number of one. What we do, people normally, scientists do, they come up with biosignatures instead of planet signatures, and then they start searching for those biosignatures in other planets. And that just makes the same sense it's looking for planet signatures, in my opinion. When your database, when all your data is based on one, any, any signature you look for uh, is suspect of what we call confirmation bias. You're not searching for something, you're confirming that something is there. You assume there is something there that has these and these properties, you just want to confirm your assumptions. Now, this is not something we do on purpose, but it's something that is underlying every, uh, every effort to search for life out there. And that, I think, is a big, important problem. So the question is no, it's not how do we discover a second genesis of life. The question is how do we discover a second genesis of life without searching for life? And that's an interesting question. How do you go about this? Can we, have, can we find a way to search for life the same way we search for exoplanets? And so to do that, we actually have to go back and obviously look at what we know. And what we know is life on Earth. This is probably, you're familiar with it. That's just a representation of the tree of life. Very simplified, but this covers our family tree for the last four billion years. Uh, we are up here now at the tip of the eukaryotes. A tip is not something hierarchical in, bi in evolutionary biology. This could be a dead end for us. The fact that we are up in the branches doesn't mean that we're better or worse. It just means that we're up in the branches. Um, uh, but what we know of, uh, based on this organization of the tree, there, there's a lot of interesting, useful information we can learn about life on Earth, and we can extract some, some of that information uh, <clears throat> 
in, in, uh, and apply it to strategies to search for life somewhere else. So we know, for example, and we'll talk about this in a second, that all the major groups of life on Earth, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes, these two are small unicellular organisms, all of them, the prokaryotes, we all come from the same last universal common ancestor, called it LUCA down here, last universal common ancestor. We all branched out of the same one, the same successful one. But this was not the origin of life. The origin of life on Earth happened somewhere here with what we call the Ur organism or the original organism. Uh, that was our founding organism. Um, and there was a period we know, or there must have been a period we know, of intense evolution between the origin of life and LUCA, where there was a lot of biochemistry going on, a lot of trial and error, a lot of mutations, a lot of organisms trying to figure things out. Even there could have been things branching out that disappeared eventually because they weren't successful enough or they weren't fitted enough. And there is no record of those anymore. Uh, we'll go back to this issue of how far into this period we can look at in a few seconds because that's important. But we can take this basic structure of life on Earth and we could just do a quick thought, pro a thought exercise on what, possibles, what possibilities are out there in terms of a second genesis. How would a second genesis relate to this? Obviously, what we mean essentially by a second genesis is a form of life that is not related to this guy. That's what we mean by a second genesis. No more, no less. Uh, we're not assigning locality to a second genesis. There could have been a second genesis on Earth, for as, as far as we know, and people have postulated uh, uh, second genesis, a, a second biosphere on the Earth lurking in the shadows that biochemically is independent from us. Now, it has never been found, but it's an interesting idea. Uh, we're looking for a second genesis, something unrelated to us originally. Uh, but we can constrain this space of what's possible, what we can possibly find out there just by making some basic assumptions. So essentially that goes back to our original idea. There is a prebiotic world, there is no life. An origin of life event happens on our planet that led to interesting biochemistry, the RNA world and whatnot, and eventually uh, <clears throat> the modern organisms branching out until today. Now, if we go to Mars and we find a form of life and we can do all the chemistry we do, we do to living organisms, uh, and it turns out that we can map this organism back, that's what it's going to look like. It's going to map somewhere in our tree of life. It's not going to be a second genesis. That's one possibility, that life out there actually shares a common ancestry. We will be able, we might be able to look to, to, uh, to establish that. Second possibility is what I, I call a close second genesis. That will be an example of a form of life that it's independent from us in origin, but it came out of the same kind of soup, organic soup. And we'll talk about it uh, in a few slides of what we mean by the same kind of soup. Or we could talk about a distant second genesis, and that will be a form of life completely unrelated to us coming out of a coming out of a very different type of prebiotic soup uh, that we couldn't even begin to imagine. Although, actually, you might think of a couple of pl one place in the solar system where that might happen. So here is what I propose as the solution to how to come out of this conundrum. How can we establish whether some a place in the solar system contains a common ancestor or a close second genesis or a distant second genesis? It goes back to something we're familiar with since the 1930s the theory of organic chemical evolution. You might be uh, familiar with, with this uh, theory if you've read about the origin of life. That's the theory that debunked the idea that life is a spontaneous generation, that life instead proposed that life is just another, it's a continuum in the process of organic chemical evolution in the universe. It's a very interesting theory. It's in fact a theory, it means that it's supported by a lot of evidence. It's right now it's the most successful explanation of how chemistry happens in the universe all the way to uh, thinking organisms. Now, <clears throat> there are four tenets in the uh, theory of organic chemical evolution. The first one is that there is chemistry going on in the universe with or without the presence of life that results in the synthesis of orga or small organic molecules like amino acids and nucleotides. These are molecules we're familiar with because those are part of our biochemistry. But they're done, it's not, life is not required for amino acids to exist. The second tenet is that the uh, combination of these small molecules forms larger molecules called polymers. Uh, and that can happen again with or without the presence of life. Now, in the case of at least one planet in the universe, the combination of those polymers eventually resulted in small droplets, self-organized droplets that we call protobionts. That would be the first organisms. And uh, 
fueled by the process of evolution by natural selection, Darwin, those pro, uh, protobionts uh, became more and more com complex, eventually figured out how to transfer information between different uh, uh, organisms, and that just cascaded into a huge um, complexity. It's still chemical complexity. The bottom line of the theory of organic chemical evolution is that these are steps that just evolve one from the other. We, don't, we, don't, we cannot separate them. We don't need to separate them. We can't separate evolution by natural selection from the origin of life, from prebiotic evolution, from basic prebiotic chemistry. It's all part of the same continuum. And because it's part of the same continuum, this should be fairly frequent in the universe. It's, there's nothing here that it's Earth-related, at least not as far as we know, or unique to the Earth. So here's a representation of the same idea in the case of the Earth. So here you have the four stages in the, in the organic chemical evolution. We start with the, neb with the solar nebula at the beginning of the, uh, of the very beginning of the solar system. We know that there were compounds, very basic molecules like water, uh, ammonia, methane, CO2. That stuff is all over the universe. Uh, it was probably present in our nebula. When the uh, planets started to form, you have room for more complex chemistry. Uh, that uh, these molecules react and they generate other basic molecules like amino acids, nucleotides, whatnot. Eventually, when the planet cools down, these things can grow into larger, more complex molecules. Think of it as a process of crystallization. The same way as lava, a hot fluid where everything is mixed and everything is, in, is chaotic, when it starts to cool, cool, to cool down, it starts to crystallize, and then you have big structures forming up. You can think of this chemistry in a similar way. Eventually, it starts to crystallize into complex forms. Now, there is a Singular event, the origin of life on Earth, where these things moved from free floating uh, complex molecules into ver something very complicated. Membranes, proteins, uh, generic material that eventually evolved through the process of Darwinian evolution into very complex organisms up until today. But it's all part of the same continuum of increasing complexity. Now, why is that important? Well, there is plenty of evidence of that. Uh, these are amino acids, sugars, lipids, and nucleobases. These are the four basic ingredients of our biochemistry. Any biochemistry on Earth is based on those uh, four types of basic com compounds. And this is examples of those compounds being found in meteorites, um, all four of them. This is the list of amino acids that have been identified in meteorites so far, that, and that they are known to be non-terrestrial. Uh, you can read all of them here, but about half of the amino acids we use to form our proteins are in this table, and they're not biogenic. The same with sugars. We tend to use this type of sugars here. There is plenty of sugars in meteorites. These are tiny cell-like structures that are formed when you put some meteorites in water. Those meteorites have uh, molecules, lipid, fat-like molecules, that when they, you put them in water and you dissolve the meteorite, they actually form these cell-like structures, which have some resemblances in, in many different ways to our own cells. And these are the nucleobases that form our DNA and RNA. Our DNA and RNA has, are made of three basic molecules. One of them are the nucleobases, and these are nucleobases found in meteorites. Now, you can see it here. Lipids, they're found in life, they're found in meteorites, they're useful for membranes. Sugars, again, they're found in life, they're found in meteorites, they're use useful for energy. What we don't see in meteorites are polymers, large sugars. That's the stuff of life. We make large stuff. We make big stuff. Uh, meteorites don't. The same with amino acids. They're found in meteorites, but we don't have proteins or very complex polymers of amino acids in meteorites. And the same with nucleobases. You don't see it here because I'm uh, in front of it, but um, there are nucleobases, as I just showed you, in meteorites, but there are not big polymers of nucleobases. Oh, it's down there. There you go. <clears throat> now, it's very important, that, that realization that our chemistry is just the basic evolution of organic chemistry and the universal chemistry, it's very important. I tried to summarize the importance of it in this diagram, and I'll try to walk you through that. Um, we, have, we know there is prebiotic chemistry. I just showed it to you with pictures, actual NASA pictures from the early solar system that we had a spacecraft taking pictures down there. And we know that there was a nebula there full of chemicals. There was no spacecraft at the early solar system. Just Disclosure, but anyway, uh, we know that there was prebiotic chemistry from which life on Earth originated at the origin of life and evolved into complex multicellular organisms. Based on the abundance of those same compounds 
in the solar, in solar system materials, we could expect that life on Mars would probably originate from a similar soup of compounds under very similar conditions. And by similar conditions, I mean water chemistry under tem temperature, pH, and salinity similar to any environment on the Earth. And so <clears throat> I would call life on Mars, if it ever existed, a closed second genesis, because it's probably evolving from the same kind of starting materials. It's not too far off to think that way. I would actually go as far as to say that life on Europa and Enceladus would probably also trace back if it turns out they exist and we, we can study their biochemistry, we can, also, we can probably trace back their biochemistry to this prebiotic soup, the same starting materials, because the same basic ingredients were used to build those, those worlds. Now, there is room for a transfer of life between planets. I just told you about panspermia, so we, can always have, we always have to leave this, this possibility open. But any of those three planets is sufficiently similar to the Earth that we could postulate the presence in them of a closed second genesis of life. Uh, whereas Titan, you can think of Titan as a place that if it has life, it should be a very different chemistry from us. It probably started with very similar materials, but very quickly, any, any process of organic chemical evolution, it very quickly probably led to something very different from what we know. And if it was life, <clears throat> which tends to speed up this process of complexity, then whatever we have there is something that we cannot really comprehend until we see it. So I call that a uh, distant second genesis of life. Now, that, why, that, why is that important? Because that's chemistry we can play with. If you tell me that life on Mars probably was a closed second genesis, and it makes sense to think that way, I know how to distinguish, I know how to tell whether there was life there at some point or not. And I'll try to convince you of that in a second. I think we're running out of time, right? Um, what I say is that because we really tend to be scientists, guess what, we tend to be uh, over optimistic, we always tend to assume that th there was life on Mars. And so, again, we go back to confirmation bias. All we have to do is to confirm it. That's why we think about searching for cells or movement or uh, crawling reptiles or growing plants or things like this, biosignatures. In fact, what we should do is what I propose, these two-fold hypotheses uh, that puts yourself in the worst case scenario to address this fundamental question. The question is not whether there is life on Mars and cells of or Europa. The question is how far did organic chemical evolution go in those planets? How far did it go? Did it go as far as the Earth? Probably not. Otherwise, there will be somebody giving a talk about this on Mars, looking back at the Earth. Uh, but you don't know in the spectrum of organic chemical evolution how far it could have gone. Maybe it stopped at the prebiotic chemistry, and that's all we see. But in any case, that's the question we need to ask. And these are the two hypotheses we need to falsify. Falsifying is a very important thing in science. We need to prove these two things to be wrong. The first one is, that, is the abiotic null hypothesis. And that means that organic chemical evolution on Mars, Europa, or Enceladus never went beyond the prebiotic chemistry. And all the chemistry we will see there is consistent with prebiotic sources. The second one, if we can falsify that one, if we can go to any of these places, run our organic chemistry kits, and we figure out that we cannot explain that chemistry based on everything we know about abiotic chemistry, then something else must explain it. That something else I propose is Earth life. It's either because of the process of panspermia or because of contamination, planetary protection, the stuff we brought with us there. If we can prove this wrong, then we have a good case for a second genesis of life, but not until we have proved these two hypotheses wrong. Now, the first one, I thought that the second one would be the easy one. It turns out that uh, I, it, I'm, I'm still, as I keep thinking through this logic, it turns out that that might not be the case. I'll tell you why in a second. The first one, testing the abiotic null hypothesis, turns out that it's not that hard to do if you think about it. Because if you keep thinking on this framework of organic chemical evolution, the universe is very lazy at making stuff. It doesn't really like to make big, complicated stuff. It likes to make a lot of simple stuff. That's why water, carbon, nitrogen, that's mostly the composition of the universe. And in terms of organics, amino acids, a few sugars, some nucleobases, and a lot of graphite. There's really, it's like, okay, that's it. That's as far as I'm gonna go. And there is a predictable, actually, pattern in the, comp in the complexity of organic chemistry that you can expect in the absence of life. That's what you see here exemplified in the case of, I think these are amino acids. Uh, these are, Plots showing carbon number and amino acids. And this is hydrocarbons. This is carbon number. So the more carbons a molecule has, the more complex it is, the harder it is to build. 
And this is what you see in terms of carbon number distributions or abundances in hydrocarbons, molecules made of carbon, carbon and hydrogen in, in abiotic systems. Here is in hydrothermal vents uh, directly sampled in the ocean and also in hydrothermal simulations in the lab. There is a lot of methane with one carbon and there is a tiny bit of ethane and propane and there is almost nothing of anything bigger than carbon-6. And you can see the same distribution in meteorites. You can see the same distribution in uh, organic chemistry uh, uh, ex experiments in the laboratory. We always end up with this exp exponential decay in abundance as a function of carbon numbers. Uh, here is what I would think to do if I was going to go to Enceladus. Actually, Cassini has already done some of the groundwork. Cassini has analyzed hydrocarbons coming out of the plume of Enceladus. These are the distribution of these dots there. They fall down the exponential decay line. Now, unfortunately, Cassini could see only up to carbon six or so. I told you that in the beginning. So we don't really know what's going on in the plume up there. If there was no life, the prediction would be that the uh, abundance of hydrocarbons larger than six or seven carbons would be like this one. There would be nothing there. But if we go there and we sample the plume and we start to see weird stuff, that's not something we can explain based on abiotic chemistry. Now, I haven't made any supposition or any assumption on the biochemistry of forms of life on Enceladus. I'm just saying that I cannot explain that abiotically. And so something else must be explaining that. And that's just for the case of hydrocarbons. If we look at amino acids, it's a very similar story because the universe always works in mysterious ways. Uh, it likes to make abiotically small amino acids, two carbons, three carbons. That's mostly the stuff you find in meteorites and stuff. Uh, and then very few of the very large carbon uh, amino acids, except when you look at life, and these are the red dots here. These are all our amino acids, the relative abundance of amino acids in our cells. Uh, none of them is higher than 10%. We don't care how many carbons the amino acid has. We care about what that amino acid does for us. And so if, it, if we need a 10 carbon amino acid, we'll invest the energy to build those 10 carbon amino acids. And so what we'll end up with is an abiotic distribution that's predictable, and it's an exponential decay on with carbon number. And any other non-exponential uh, distribution is not something that we can explain abiotically. I'm not saying it, it's not abiotic, but until we find an abiotic explanation, uh, the best alternative is a form of life. Now, <clears throat> this is an example of that uh, same principle. This is the amino acid. This, these are uh, six, five, seven amino acids uh, that are commonly found in meteorites and in organisms on, on Earth. This is the abundance that we see for those amino acids in car with carbon number. That's two carbon numbers. These are, I think, five carbon numbers. In meteorites, you see the exponential decay. In life, you see a very different pattern. So that's the stuff we need to look for. Now, <clears throat> the second hypothesis, if we go to Enceladus and we have these distributions that we cannot explain abiotically, then we need to show that it's not stuff that we brought with us or it's stuff that was transferred between planets. That's what we call the terrestrial null hypothesis. And I thought that that would be the easy one because we do that all the time. All the time on Earth, we study ancestry. That's what we do when we look at DNA and proteins. We try to establish ancestral relations between organisms. So if we go to Enceladus, uh, it should be fairly easy to uh, establish ancestral relations and, to, and determine whether they came out of our tree or they came from a different tree. Now, the problem with that is, and that's where I'm going to stop, so we could look at all these molecules, DNA on Earth, non-DNA, a second genesis, a three-letter genetic code, different code. Uh, we look for different types of proteins or different cell structures and all that good stuff. Now, here's the problem, though, and that's where I'm stopping. We go back to our famous tree of life. It turns out that everything we know about biochemistry, because of the virtue of how life on Earth has evolved, can only be really traced back to Luca, the last universal common ancestor. You can think of that, or at least I think of that, as a biochemical horizon. We cannot see beyond that biochemical horizon because we've lost all that information. No photo albums of, of our family before Luca. There is no, nothing preserved in the rocks other than shapes. There's no chemistry preserved in the rocks. It was too, too long ago. So we, we can't really tell what the biochemistry was back then. All we know about biochemistry stops and starts with Luca. And so any biochemical difference uh, becomes between life on Earth and another planet becomes questionable, whether it, impl it implies a second genesis or implies a common ancestor. And that's even more so when we start looking for a close second genesis that we all came up of the, of the same soup. 
because we never know we we will never know <clears throat> the exact composition of the first organism it's it, it might be impossible to actually tell a close second genesis from a common ancestor that's what I, my thinking was as of 10 a.m this morning and so uh, maybe i come up with a better idea later today but uh, that's i think it's a very interesting question to think about uh, it might be an actual limitation in our understanding of, search, or, uh, of how we search for life in the universe. And so just to leave some time for questions, I'll leave you with the conclusions. They just summarize what I just said. We can read them as we, uh, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. So thank you very much. Uh, so my question is, as far as we know, is it possible to have life that's not, not based on biochemistry? Well, <clears throat> we will call it biochemistry. It might be a different, very different types of biochemistry. Okay. The moment you talk about life, life, biochemistry, they're synony synonymous kind of thing. It might be not carbon-based. That's probably what you're more thinking about. Um, yeah, or even similar to AI. Oh, well, like a uh, different dimension, well, maybe. If you, can, if you can have AI evolving from nothing, like if there is, <laughs> if, if you can come up with a theory of silicon organic evo or evolution or silica evolution, uh, then yes. Oh, okay. uh, but uh, um, our, our assumption is that any AI was uh, comes not from spontaneous or uh, uh, spontaneous chemistry, but from biochemistry. You need biochemistry for AI to exist. Right, something oh, that's similar. An interesting question. Uh, if we if we want to go into the concept of artificial, that's oof, we can have another talk about not that. Artificial. Yeah. yeah. But like, right, right, but something similar to the composition of AI, like in that it's very virtual for us. You, uh, people have proposed silicon-based life, but they weren't thinking of microchips. They were thinking of the actual element and how it could sustain a biochemistry analogous to carbon. But silicon-based life has very different properties. It's, it's very constrained. And if in reality, I mean, obviously, you can never reject the idea of silicon-based life. Again, the, the element, not the microchip. Uh, but it's not an accident that we're made of carbon. Carbon is the third most abundant element or fourth more abundant element in the universe. And the other one is oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and helium. So other than the helium, we pretty much covered the entire real state of the universe in terms of elemental composition. There is no accident that we're made of that stuff. Um, there might be weird things out there, but for those weird things to exist, there would, there would, have, there would have to be a process of chemical distillation where carbon is removed from the equation and therefore allows weird silicon stuff to evolve. Uh, when it comes to AI, I think for uh, behind every intelligent being, there is a bacteria, at least evolutionary, evolutionarily speaking. So it has to come from organic chemistry at some point. Can we move back to the previous slide? So, so <coughs> I, I, don't, I don't really uh, understand you, your uh, yeah. thought process I, about why we have there uh, about Bio chem uh, chemical, you know, horizon. Right. So is that because we assume uh, all the uh, uh, you call it own uh, or organism and the local? You see, we see no trace between the you know the, um, the chemical composition. Any proof or, or evidence around there? So so I don't follow that part. Uh, yeah, I I, I rushed to that because I I was uh, thought I was running out of time, but. Uh, everything, so obviously we are here. You can think of that as a space-time diagram, so to speak. We are here now at the tip of the eukaryotes, and we have our, our technology to investigate biochemistry. Uh, so we, we can go about uh, studying biochemistry in many different ways. We can go and dissect an elephant and understand the chemistry of the elephant, or we can go through the fossil record and look for fossilized organisms, and we investigate their biochemistry, so we can be looking for this. We can look for deep, deeply branching modern organisms that we know existed a long time ago, and we can look at their biochemistry. We can even look at our own biochemistry, our own DNA, and look for what we call molecular fossils, stuff that is in our DNA. Don't think of it, it's not trash DNA, but think of it as stuff that at some point was useful, it's not useful anymore, type of thing. Now, really, all that biochemistry, whether it's modern, fossil, or ancient, it goes back to Luca. Really, you can also only trace back that to this last universal common ancestor. You can really not make any substantial inference 
based on this biochemistry about this biochemistry, because all this record is known. Obviously, this biochemistry evolved from this. Uh, but the notion that all organisms have DNA and RNA in their composition, 20 amino acids in their proteins, the genetic code as we understand it, all that is because, comes from LUCA. There could have been branches coming out that had a different biochemistry. We will never know if they existed or not because they have been lost. We don't know if these organisms had 20 amino acids or 10 amino acids. Uh, we don't know, we actually know that at some point they weren't DNA based. People have postulated the RNA world. There was a world, there was a period of time where there was no DNA biochemistry on Earth. It was RNA based. People have postulated that RNA probably was not the first genetic molecule. There was another different type of molecule. And people have even postulated uh, metal enzymes, enzymes based on magnesium and zinc and other metal compounds that were the first catalyzing compounds. So the more you go back in time, the more you realize that our biochemistry is not representative really of this biochemistry. It can only be traced back to LUCA. Uh, and so that really means that if you go to, I'll, I'll give you the basic example. If I go to Mars and I find a microbe that does, doesn't have DNA, all I can tell you right now is that this is, didn't come out of LUCA. Yeah. I don't know if it came out of this branch that was not DNA based. And I don't know if it, because there could have been transfer, a transfer of life on Mars very early on where there was life on, on, on the Earth, very likely not DNA or RNA based. It would look like very different from us because the moment it gets transferred, this evolutionary line gets broken. Then you start having to... I, I, I see. So, 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 so I see that the purposeful research is trying to prove the second form of a, a genesis-based life. Instead of, instead of simply prove their life ever existed. That, I've yeah. been advocating for that from a science point of view, and I didn't really emphasize that, but from a science point of view, if you think of scientists as monks of knowledge, people who are very obsessed with knowledge based, discovering life is not really the end goal. That's stuff for, you know, for explorers. <laughs> uh, that, you know, as somebody put it, um, if you discover life on another planet, I mean, th the bottom line is that as a scientist, we shouldn't think about the, uh, this finding life as the end goal. That's when things begin. The reason, and, I, and it goes back to my original argument about why we're searching for life. Why are we searching for a second genesis of life? One of the reasons is because we will never understand the origin of life on Earth unless we find a second genesis, plain and simple. Second one is because we might never understand all this process. Third example is because we might never understand the range of biochemical possibilities out there. And so finding life is just what needs to happen for us to start addressing those questions. Yeah, thank uh, you very much. Thank so you it much. shouldn't be just yeah. about searching or finding it. It should be about finding a second genesis. Um, I do have a quick question from uh, someone on the live stream. So this is from Tyler. He says, uh, does hydrothermal vents on the moon mean that it has a molten core? Yes. Uh, Got that, Tyler? So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's obviously based on inf inference, but um, the observation, I guess, um, I'll, tra I'll trace it back. So uh, as, as we travel back in time, um, the uh, observation that we can uh, be sure about is the silicon nanograins in the plume of Enceladus. Now, uh, the, the most likely explanation for that, those silicon nanograins are hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. We haven't seen the vents, it's true. Everything we know about the moon, though, suggests that there are hydrothermal vents there. What that implies is that there is a source of heat underneath the vents. The most likely source of heat is some kind of molten core uh, due to the gravity pressures due to the Saturn orbit that just creates enough uh, gravitational stress on the moon that it actually keeps the whole uh, core molten, just like the core of the Earth. Now, there could be additional sources of, of heat, like radioactive decay that generates heat. Uh, but the fact that we see evidence of hydrothermal activity, it's a strong suggestion that the core of the moon is in fact at least partially molten and is acting as a source of energy, which is something that is very interesting as well, because that implies that uh, probably Europa is the same scenario. Europa is even bigger, but it has the same kind of uh, giant planet around causing gravity pulls. And so you would ex you should ex we should expect hydrothermal vents at the bottom of Europa as well. 
molten rock. So uh, the composition um, <coughs> of those moons, obviously it's not known because we haven't analyzed them, but based on everything we know again, the most likely starting materials were not probably not different from the starting materials of the Earth. Chondrite meteorites, meteorites of uh, asteroids, comets, lots of icy stuff because they were far away in the, in the outskirts of the solar system, so it was cold. But it was probably stuff similar to what generated the Earth. Now, on Earth, because it's a big planet, there was plenty of room for, and obviously we all started the same way as a big molten ball of lava. Then Celebus started that way, Europa, the Earth. The, the Earth was large enough that when it cooled down, there was plenty of room for heavy stuff to fall off uh, because the cooling process was probably slow. And so when you cool it slow, it's like when you cook it slow, things get better, separated and stuff like this. Uh, so uh, you could, that's what happened on the Earth. The planet was big enough, the cooling was slow, so heavy stuff like iron and heavy metals dropped to the, uh, to the core and formed our core. And Celadus is very small, so it probably cooled very fast without a chance for things to differentiate. So what you have there in the core is probably still very representative of the original materials. And the, other, the only stuff that was uh, kicked out in the cooling process was probably stuff that is volatile, like water. And that's why you have a notion of liquid water on the surface and a lot of methane and stuff, which are, all that stuff, it doesn't take high temperatures for that stuff to come out of the rock. Uh, but the silica, the minerals, uh, things like this that form these meteorites is probably still molten there, not changing much. I don't know why so I stopped in this. Uh, <laughs> so not being very familiar with uh, this common ancestor of all life on Earth, is that Luca meant to be like one cell once back in time or just... Uh, the origin? Yeah. <clears throat> well, that that's part of, of the question, right? Uh, we don't know. Anything we can... The only thing we can say for sure about the origin of life on Earth is that we don't know. Uh, it must have happened, that's for sure. <laughs> Oh, unless, well, there is the, you know, the holographic universe and matrix, but uh, let's assume that it happened. Um, um, there are theories on how you could possibly envision it happening gradually. Obviously, it wasn't just like that. Probably there was a combination of uh, molecular complexity happening. Eventually, you need to self-enclose something so there is detached from the environment. And at some point, that self-enclosed thing that you can probably not still call life yet, uh, has to have the ability of replicating or passing on information, which is really what defines life. So at that point, that's when you talk about life. But that transition was probably part of an uh, ongoing process of, evolution, of chemical evolution. How it happened, we don't know. If it was one cell or if it was a protoplasm of goo covered with stuff, that we don't know. Uh, it, it was probably not anything like what we think today. Uh, Tal Rose, who was one of the uh, instigators of our modern understanding of biochemistry, uh, describes this in a way that I, what I, I, I described it earlier in the process of crystallization, of lava crystallizing. So it starts randomly and chaotically, and slowly as it cools down, it becomes something more organized, complex. And eventually, you end up with a self-replicating entity, call it a cell or a goo. And then that's when the process of Darwinian evolution kicks. And then complexity just goes off the roof. Um, but it's all part of the same process. So it's really hard to tell how it started. How it, it, if we were to travel back to four and a half billion years ago, 4.2 billion years ago, um, it'd probably be, be hard pressed to tell whether it's life that we see there versus very complex prebiotic chemistry versus something entirely different. Yeah. But we don't know. We need more data points to really know that. And, and that, I think that's a very important point to keep in mind why it's important to search for life out there, because we will never know unless we find another genesis. We can cook as many things as we want in the lab. It's very unlikely we will generate life in the lab uh, from zero, from scratch. And so. Uh, I hope it, it hopefully happens, but, uh, but my guess is that not until we find a second genesis, we can really understand the way life on Earth originated. Cool. And what's LUCA stand for? <laughs> uh, what? What does it mean, LUCA? What does it stand for? LUCA, yeah. Last Universal Common Ancestor. So my question is, what are um, the options for detecting 
biotic organic evolution in exoplanets? Right now, it's, un it's very unlikely we, we can do it. Uh, but uh, assuming unlimited funds and technology that doesn't exist, you could think of, you could search for um, <clears throat> chemical disequilibria in atmosphere in the atmosphere of exoplanets. So obviously, the first thing you would do would be, because there is so many of them, you would shorten the list. And you would focus on the ones that are at uh, the right distance from the sun, the right, the right distance defined as the distance that allows liquid water to be stable on the surface. So you focus on those. And then on those, you could search for disequilibrium in the atmosphere. So coexistence of gases that shouldn't coexist unless something is pumping them in the atmosphere. On Earth, you have the example of oxygen. There is in high abundance. There is no abiotic way of making that much oxygen in, you know, on a planet, uh, although people have come up with clever ways of doing it. Uh, but the fact that you have oxygen and methane coexisting all the time means that both are being produced because otherwise they would annihilate each other. They would cancel each other. I meant more, is it possible to detect this, um, uh, these weird distributions of carbon chains? Not that nope. distance. We need samples for that. We need, right. we need stuff. We need to be able to inject something in an instrument to do these type of detections. We can, we can certainly detect carbon hydrogen, so we can detect, like we've done in uh, uh, interstellar space, you can detect certain compounds, um, but mostly you detect is CO2, methane, and all that stuff. Uh, the abundance of this, so I'll, I guess I'll give you another example. We've, we've, done for the, we've gone through the thought exercise of if we wanted to detect those molecules on Enceladus coming out of the plume, what should be our limit of detection so that if we don't find anything, we can be confident that there is nothing in there. And I think our latest estimate was we should be, our instrument should be able to detect femtomolar abundance. That's 10 to the minus 15 uh, concentrations. Um, <clears throat> in order to be able to tell, well, you know what, there's nothing there. Uh, and to do that, we need the best instruments on Earth and we need a very complicated way of collecting enough material from the ocean that we can actually inject into the instruments. Doing that remotely with telescopes, it's a, it's a showstopper. And, the pro, and so uh, the, fact, the, the fact that you don't see them wouldn't mean that they're not there uh, because your limit of detection would be so uh, inaccurate. Uh, you can only say that based on your limit of detection, you can see trees on whatever planet you have out there. Not even, I mean, other people have proposed to look at the surface and uh, like if you look at the surface of the Earth, you could detect chlorophyll, for example. But you need a planet like the Earth and you need a satellite orbiting the, the planet. You can't do that from Alpha Centauri. Uh, um, if I may, another question. So you mentioned that um, the stuff in our solar system was made from a previous star. I wonder what the chances are of life um, becoming recycled through that process. Yeah. <laughs> uh, people have looked into that, uh, both in terms of the, the problem of transfer of life between planets or life surviving. And again, it's, uh, <clears throat> uh, you can always fit a model to anything you want. Uh, but life is very resilient at surviving in dormant state, that we know. Uh, and there are scenarios, when you think about the transfer of, planet, of life between Earth and Mars, there are plausible scenarios of rocks moving from one planet to the next in time scales that are shorter than what we know microbes can survive dormant. That much we can say. Uh, and when it comes to cometary panspermia, so life com originating, it, in the end it really comes, back to, comes down to how big a chunk of material you have floating around. Uh, because really what kills out there is not the cold, it's the radiation. Uh, time kills eventually, but, but it takes a long time for time to kill and nothing else. Uh, radiation is what really kills you quickly out there. So if you're a microbe sitting in the, in the nucleus of a big asteroid, and we're talking a few kilometers in size, you probably will never see enough radiation to kill you over hundreds of millions of years. Uh, and so uh, it, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but um, you can always find a plausible scenario where a microbe could survive, bottom line. I don't think we should expect that to be the first explanation, 
But the problem is that you can't rule it out. There's no amount of hand waving you can do to rule that possibility out until you go and you find a second genesis of life on Mars, truly. And then you can confidently say that life on Earth didn't originate out of that comet or that cometary or that it wasn't transfer. Uh, as long as you don't find a second genesis, that, question, that possibility is always going to be open, which is a very important thing. I don't want to keep you, but it's a very, <clears throat> I didn't mention that, but it's a, it really speaks to how we search for life as well. Because when you think about a second genesis and how and distinguish between the second genesis and a possible common origin, not every biosignature is equal. If you find, if you go to Mars, I don't know if you guys know about stromatolites. Uh, there are, these are microbial, there are rocks that are made by microbial activity and they're fossilized. And we say them in the fossil record. Uh, and what you see in the fossil record is just the shape of the rock that looks uh, weird, but there's nothing in that rock that speaks of life other than the shape. Uh, now, if we go to Mars, actually, oh, I'm too far away. If we go to Mars and we find a stromatolite, this weird shape, maybe you can tell there was life on Mars at some point, but you can't tell how it originated. You will never tell based on the shape of stromatolites whether it's a common origin or a second genesis. And so uh, that might be one of those things that happen 20 years from now when we find it, and then we get all excited and we publish our paper in Nature, and then next day it's like, wait a second, <laughs> where did this guy come from? And then we have to send another mission to search for biochemistry. And so it really matters how we think about the search for life before we start searching for it, because you can end up with many years of uh, time and money not spent the right way. I'll still be happy if we find a stromatolite on Mars, but, uh, but yeah, thank you. <laughs>